See them fighting for power, but they know not the hour. So them bribing with their guns, spare parts and money. Trying to belittle our integrity. They say what we know is just what they teach us. And we're so ignorant, cause every time they can't reach us through political strategy. They keep us hungry, and when you're gonna get some food, your brother's gotta be your enemy. Well, I'm pushing the knife. All guns aiming at me now. I'm pushing the knife. They open fire on me. I'm pushing the knife. Protected by his majesty. Ooh, -wee. ooh, -wee. ooh, -wee. ooh, -wee. ooh, -wee. ooh -oh. Well, what we know is not what they tell us. And we're not ignorant, I mean it. And they just could not touch us through the powers of the most high. We keep on surfacing through the powers of the most high. We keep on surviving, yeah, I'm pushing the night. Planned by society, I'm pushing the night. They're trying to conquer me, I'm pushing the knife. Anything that money can bring. Ooh, we got, wait, we got Laguna, special guest on this next one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you ready? Come around this way. Other way. All right, she's here. <laughs> It's weird, like when you grow up away from politics and like, you know, a working class or whatever, you don't realize like what's really shaping the politics. And for me, I came to realize like in my late twenties, a lot of it was just like the music I listened to and, and shit. Um, I mean, in addition to the oppression, but that's, that's just kind of like what, what uh, made sense. No, you gotta sing, put that down, put that down. Hey, Connie, I'll let, do you want, um... Can I, can I just introduce you guys for a moment oh, here? Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. I, didn't, I thought I was just like filling No, in. no, I appreciate you getting us started. <laughs> Thank you for playing. Um, uh, this is uh, my friend, Kaniela Ng. Kaniela is currently the Climate Justice Campaign Director at People's Action. He's also a former state representative for, the, uh, for Hawaii. And uh, we're going to be hearing uh, another song or maybe one or two more songs here from Kaniela and Laguna. Cool. Uh, yeah, this one's from the Mauna Kea movement. Kai ko ka moana, kai ana ne Hawaii, na we we a halulu, ka honu a haumea, na kulu kulu e kalani, ki e ki e kamalinguna. Aweke aloha ole makamali hini. Kuwa aeo. Kuwa aeo. Mama kakawa. Mama kakawa. No kuwaina. No kuwaina. No kee kuka kayaka. Ana oivi o Hawaii ne no kukula hui e ha avipa a i o la mau. One more time. Kua. Kua aeo. Kua aeo. No kuvai. E kua vai i. Mama kakaua. Mama kakaua. Mama 
Cool. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> hey, thank you so much, Connie. Uh, Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kathy Garcia. Uh, she, hers, from DSA Santa Fe and a steering committee member of uh, Socialist Majority. Um, thank you all so much for being here with us. Uh, thank you again, Kaniela, for kicking off our event with such wonderful music. Um, so uh, we are here for uh, eco-socialism and feminism and all kinds of uh, wonderful topics that are going to be informing all of the work that we're doing, um, not just in DSA, of course, but of course with all of our uh, uh, collab uh, collaborators, our uh, coalition partners, and all of our uh, comrades in solidarity uh, locally, uh, nationally, and around the world. Um, Democratic Socialists of America is the largest and fastest growing socialist organization in the United States. Uh, we are not a political party, uh, but we are a member-driven rank-and-file organization uh, that is driven by uh, participation of our members as organizers and activists in the struggle for liberation. Um, Socialist Majority is a caucus of DSA, uh, and our members are working to transform DSA into a mass multiracial organization that builds with other working class and progressive groups uh, and is growing the social force necessary uh, for a true socialist majority in the United States and globally. Um, so uh, again, thank you all for being here with us. Um, I'm going to introduce our speakers um, and then I will be moderating the panel discussion. Um, first, uh, we have uh, Thea Rio Francos, a DSA member, uh, a, a professor and a published author um, who uses she, her pronouns. Uh, Thea, would you like to just wave at everyone first for a second? Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Jolene Levitt, who is a uh, organizer with United Teachers Los Angeles, uh, an affiliate of AFT and NEA over in Los Angeles Unified School District. Um, you may have heard of them. They're kind of a big deal in union organizing right now. Um, and uh, Jolene also uses she, her pronouns. Uh, Jolene, could you wave at our cameras for a second? Thank you so much. Um, and finally, uh, we have uh, Jennifer Marley, uh, who is uh, from San Ildefonso Pueblo and a Tewa person uh, who is representing the Red Nation and the Pueblo Feminist Caucus uh, from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Jennifer, could you wave at our, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna kick off with our first question. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go around with all of our panelists and give them each an opportunity to answer this question. Um, first question. Please tell us about your history and your contexts. What brought you to the organizing you do now? Thea? Hi, thank you so much for having me on this event. It's amazing to see so many folks um, on the call and I'm like, honored and intimidated because the, the other panelists are so inspiring. Um, but I'll, I'll sort of situate a little bit my political trajectory um, and try to keep it short because I want plenty of time for everyone else to, to speak and for um, Q&A later on. Um, but um, it makes me feel a little old to say this, but I've been sort of involved in left politics for about two decades now. Um, first probably got started when I was around 16 um, in a moment where there was a lot of sort of anti and alter globalization um, protests happening against the IMF and the WTO. And that was sort of when I got inserted into, into left politics. Um, but I think my most formative experiences were earlier in kind of in college and then after I graduated college, I did a lot of work in the sort of Latin America solidarity world, which is folks may or may not be familiar, but there's a long history of solidarity organizing and activism between the US and Latin America. A lot of that grew, up, grew out of the sort of Reagan's dirty wars in the, in the late 70s and early 80s and people being in solidarity with Central America. And then that brought it into a sort of broader set of movements. Um, so I was doing this in the kind of early 2000s. Um, so I did a lot of Latin America solidarity work and that looked like being involved um, in solidarity with movements in Latin America, but also in complicated ways being in solidarity with left-wing governments in Latin America. We can talk about that more another time. This is the kind of beginning of what's called 
the pink tide where a lot of left-wing governments um, like Evo Morales and Hugo Chavez and, and others came to power in Latin America. So it was an interesting though also complex moment for sort of doing solidarity work with the region. Um, I also was involved in a lot of immigrant rights work. So fast forwarding a little bit to 2006 was a moment of massive um, immigrant rights protests actually on May Day, a really inspiring um, May 1st, 2006 um, migrant justice organizers around the country. And we have Jolene from LA, you know, sort of a similar, uh, uh, that was a major side of protest. I was in Portland, which was also a major side of protest and sort of immigrant workers reclaiming that holiday um, um, as a day of, of, of worker struggle. And that was a very inspiring thing to be involved in. Um, and then in terms of sort of organizing or sort of being, a, a, working as an organizer, um, my first experience there was doing anti-recruitment work. Um, so this is in the sort of height of the war on terror, which unfortunately is a thing that still is going on. But this was again in the sort of 2007-8 um, period, there was a big surge in, in recruitment. And a lot of that happened in working class and um, communities of color. And I was doing anti-recruitment work in, um, in Portland, Oregon, again, um, and focusing a lot on sort of working in high schools that were predominantly youth of color and immigrants, kind of doing, kind of doing like, uh, I guess, popular pedagogy around what is the military industrial complex? What are they trying to recruit you into? And what are alternative livelihoods that don't involve sort of fighting imperialist wars, but still address your economic needs? Or sort of thinking about the intersections of the anti-war movement, with movements for racial justice um, and, and labor rights um, and just kind of, you know, having economic opportunities for these youth that did not depend on them um, joining the military, um, which many of them didn't want to do per se, but were doing it for economic reasons. So just to sort of bring that home and wrap up, um, I think that, you know, what all of that, all of those experiences taught me were A, like the centrality of anti-imperialism to all of the politics that we do. So like whether it was the Latin America work or the immigrant rights work or the anti-recruitment work, all of that sort of had a global perspective um, and, and really saw solidarity with communities around the world as being central to what the left should be in the US. Um, and then the other piece, and I, I know Jolene will and, 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 um, um, and Jennifer will also speak more to this, but just thinking about multiracial organizing. So that Latin America solidarity work that I did was a, was in a way an unusual, and I say this because it's unfortunate that it's unusual, but an unusual experience on the left of like a very truly not only multiracial but multi-generational um, organizing space that that and that was sort of what I came up in and, and then kind of had that expectation of all the work I did, though unfortunately so many times on the left that's not how spaces are organized and we should we're going to talk about that much more but it, it certainly was a value that 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 was like dear to me from from a young age due to those um due to those experiences um that i was involved in and i'll leave it there for now and i appreciate the personal question because i think you know that's how we learn our politics and it's really nice to hear you know i'm looking forward to hearing how other folks got got involved in the social justice work they do Jolene, could you speak next, please? Everyone, um, thank you for having me again. So, <clears throat> um, I don't know how to summarize this, but it was basically life circumstances that brought me to organizing. Um, when I was 16 years old, um, it was the first time I became a survivor of domestic violence and sexual violence. And it was feminist that frankly saved my life. They gave me language to be able to um, articulate what I'm going through. And um, I was organized at 19 years old by feminists of color. Um, and it was them that mentored me. So um, I became involved in Affirm. That's my primary political organization. It's an anti-imperialist and transnational feminist women's organization with about 10 chapters across the country. And then we work with women across the globe transnationally. I think I see one woman on here from Toronto, if I'm not mistaken, um, who organizes women workers. And um, yeah, I, feminists saved my life. And in college, well, when I was a child, I saw my father go on strike as a patient transporter in his hospital. Both my mother and my paternal grandmother's Union drives were busted by bosses uh, at a private hospital here in Los Angeles. Um, and so when I was given the opportunity to apply for a, like a labor summer, I took it. 
Um, and I've been a full-time union organizer since 2004. I did a 2002 summer internship. And then since 2004, I've been like nonstop in the labor movement. And um, feminists also gave me the opportunity to train with women trade unionists in the Philippines. So I did two six month stints with uh, peasant sugarcane workers in central Luzon. And then again, in 2007, for six months, I organized and learned from uh, women garment worker organizers building up towards a strike. So I owe everything to the feminist movement, particularly uh, women of color and transnational and immigrant feminists. Thank you for that, Jolene. Jennifer? Sure. So um, I'm only 23, so I don't have a, a super long <laughs> um, history of how I got into organizing, but I started when I was 14. Um, I, you know, like many people, entered through the nonprofit industrial complex. Um, I, I was, um, I came from a really rural area, so um, uh, one of the organizations I worked with was the Santa Fe Mountain Center. And I got involved with um, um, LGBTQ justice, trans rights. That was the first type of organizing I got into. Um, and as time went on, um, um, the politics of that organization got more intersectional. So I found it useful as a hub to um, organize uh, around Native issues, and particularly Native queer issues. Um, the area I'm from, I, very conservative and very Catholic, so um, it was work that urgently needed to be done. And um, and then I, you know, I organized in my high school um, and did some GSA work, uh, Native American Club work. And when I came to college, um, I got involved with an organization called Kiva Club, which is over really old. It's, it's it was founded in 1952. And um, they're known for um, their activism um, around border town justice. Um, border town in this case, meaning um, cities and towns that border reservations. Um, and um, places like Albuquerque, Gallup, and Farmington, and other border towns throughout Arizona are notorious places of anti-Indian violence, both by the state, um, lots of rampant police violence, but also um, non-native vigilante violence. And then through Kiva Club, I got involved with Red Nation. And I got involved with Red Nation right as they were just coming into existence um, in about 2000, early 2015. And uh, I've been organizing with them ever since. And I've worked in many coalitions, uh, volunteered with other organizations, um, and in 2018, I helped co-found the um, Pub Pueblo Pueblo Public Feminist Caucus of the Red Nation um, because we had existed um, on Pueblo land for the entirety of our existence, and um, I was looking to build something that addresses the specific material conditions within Pueblo communities that exist um, and many of the ailments that exist. Um, are due to gender violence directly. And of course, it's kind of the linchpin um, that holds together all of the issues surrounding the environmental violence, the presence of the nuclear industrial complex on our land, and, and so on. So yeah, that's how I got into organizing. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you all of you for that. Um, our second question, this one's a doozy. The first one was short, second one, not so much. Okay. As we see a growth of power and numbers in left movements and reactionary chauvinism increasing on the right, what do you think is more, what do you think is important for people new to organizing and for those more seasoned who are organizing and training them to keep in mind as we aim to not emulate patriarchy white and white supremacy as we continue to build multiracial and multi-generational political spaces. So I'm gonna go around. Uh, I'm gonna start with uh, Jolene this time. 
Um, and then I'll go to Thea and then I'll go to Jennifer. Sure. So before I get like, deeper into this, I just want to say that uh, reactionary chauvinism isn't just a disease of the right wing. And I think that um, if you think back to all the revolutionary movements and organizations that have come before us, um, you, can, you can quite literally read the history of how many of them uh, condone violence, condone sexual violence, objectified women. I mean, some of our most revered heroes in our revolutions were also, quote, womanizers. And I know when I said that, I know, you've, I know you thought of some, right, when I said that word. Um, but I think that as, as organizers, we have to keep in mind that everything that we do has to be explicitly and purposefully feminist. Um, it can't just be an afterthought because uh, unfortunately, uh, with a settler, settler colonial state, patriar patriarchy has become the norm, the quote unquote norm in this country, right? So that's why it's not just about the right wing. In fact, some of the most toxic and harmful and hurtful um, reactionary chauvinism has come from within our movements. Um, and so some like, some like really easy ways to combat that up front is to one, purposefully develop women, especially women of color as leaders. Um, women have to be in leadership roles at all levels of our organizations, all levels of our movements, all levels of our collectives. It just has to happen. Um, feminism has to be both a personal practice in our interpersonal relationships with our comrades and also a political practice built into our organizations, right? So um, it has to be stated in all your bylaws, in all of your ground rules, in all of your constitutions, um, and there has to be an accountability arm also built in along with those feminist principles. Um, and so I just wanted to like say that if we don't purposefully built this into our movements, into our organizations, we revert back to what the norm is in this country, and that's patriarchy. Um, so I'm going to leave it at, at that and let, you know, let others uh, answer, and keep, we can come back if we want. Thea? Thank you so much for that. Jolene and I, um, and I'm liking just how the complimentary different answers here. So I'm, I'm glad that you set that out because I think that that explicit intentionality is, is like the first place to begin this. Um, and also like an internal critique of the way our own movements replicate these structures. And I guess just sort of jumping off from that, a few things that came to mind for me in reading this question are, I'll just lay them out and then I'll get into each of them briefly. Like one is how our issues are framed. Two is how our meetings, events um, are, are run and organized. And three is how we relate to the political context in which we find ourselves. And so I think about framing issues like, you know, I, it was already said and I mentioned it, like I've, I'm uh, on the Eco-Socialist Steering Committee of, of, of DSA. Climate change is an issue that I work on every day. But like, what is climate change, right? Like, how do we actually define that issue in a way that is that reflects the intersectional reality of the causes of climate change and of the consequences of climate change, right? And so, you know, one of the the ways that I think is is, is one of the most concrete ways that I think about with eco socialist work is thinking about how climate change relates to the every our everyday life. And one of the key things of our everyday life is where we live, like literally housing, right? And and the buildings that we live in. And some of the most inspiring eco-socialist work out there to me is tenants' rights organizing for a for like more affordable housing, for more secure housing, and for more environmental and green housing. Um, and that's just like a, a, a way to just sort of say, and I'm gonna to get to the feminist piece and the racial justice piece in a second, but just to say that like, we can define climate change as a super abstract thing or about conserving the environment in some abstract way, or we can think about like, how does the climate crisis affect our lives? Um, and one of the ways it affects our lives is like, just literally how our cities are planned and whether they're planned in a way that, um, that, that is better for the environment or not, and whether they're planned in a way that is more affordable or not. And so I think like the green social housing and green public housing movement that sort of 
come up and builds up on, on tenants' rights organizing is very inspiring to me. And housing is also so deeply a feminist issue and a racial justice issue in terms of you know, who has access to housing, who is the victim of evictions and housing precarity, um, how redlining and segregation like deeply structures our built environment. And that's a way for climate organizing for climate politics to connect very concretely with other social justice issues and sort of have an intersectional analysis um, of, of what the crisis, of what the climate crisis is and where it comes from. And something that happens to be very near and dear to me and I'm sure many people on this call who have experienced housing precarity. And if we can actually say one way to, to deal with the climate crisis is to make sure that everyone has affordable housing because climate causes migration. We all need a place to live. We might have to believe the places that we are. So all of us need a guaranteed home. And also our home should be environmentally, you know, and green and energy efficient and all these things. And everyone should have guaranteed access to that. That's a way to frame climate change that I think speaks to the everyday experience of so many people. And I you know, grew up in, in a very housing insecure environment, dealt with multiple evictions in my life. And again, I'm sure this is a very shared experience, unfortunately, in this in this call. And so I think that's like a way to frame the issue. And then I'll just say the other two more briefly because I've spent too long on the first piece, which is how our meetings and events are run. And just, you know, Jolene talked about intentionality with like our bylaws and our ground rules. And I think that just naturally sort of what flows from that is thinking about, you know, how are our meetings run? Is it a, is, is there childcare? I mean, all of these things that like, almost sounds so basic to say it, but it's not basic because it's usually not the case. We usually don't have childcare. Usually meetings are not run at times that are accessible for working class people, for women, you know, who might have, you know, double duty, who might have other responsibilities. So how do we actually just organize our meetings so that the most people can participate? And then within those meetings, make sure that we're lifting up the voices of people who are not speaking as much or maybe don't have the confidence or X, Y, and Z, right? So that gets into literally things like progressive stack. But, you know, these are really important issues, I think, because because they can totally transform who becomes a leader. And the last thing I'll say um, that kind of goes back to the first point about always framing our issues in intersectional ways and in very concrete ways that speak to the injustices that many of us feel in our everyday lives is, is coalitional work is just something that's very near and dear to my heart. And I think like the more that DSA or any group, you know, in terms of who is represented here engages in that coalitional work, the more we are likely to have an intersectional analysis and the more we're likely to actually be working with a, the diverse multiracial and women led working class um, rather than siloing ourselves off into a, you know, our specific you know, idea of what the issue is. And I think you know, coalitional work is challenging and sometimes unsettling and sometimes puts us in situations where it's like, how do I relate to this person that is different than me? But that's like obviously what, you know, those challenging situations are the situations we should seek out, put ourselves in, because I think that's how movement growth and popular kind of power grows. Um, comes from. Thank you, Thea. Um, Jennifer, thoughts on reactionary chauvinism, patriarchy, white supremacy? Sure. Um, so, um, kind of in response to this, um, Red Nation on the whole is explicitly queer indigenous feminist, um, not just the public feminist caucus. And um, we, we, want to make sure that everybody understands that's one of our primary principles. Um, and I guess some examples of how we're confronting that within the organizing and training new organizers is um, really upfront having a very detailed conversation about um, sexual violence and how we handle that and how we handle um, any perps or um, any confrontations within the organization, how we handle it. Um, and broader coalitions with other organizations. Um, so recently we had a lot of new comrades join um, who were coming from other organizations who had dealt um, with um, perpetrators and leadership. And so um, together we all kind of started um, coming up with ways to talk about these things. And um, it's one of the first things we address when um, we're having recruitment meetings or in our meaningful and practice school that just got started. Um, and sorry, I'm kind of losing my train of thought. Um, oh, and then another thing that's really important for how we put these things into practice is um, we learn from our mistakes. So a lot of the um, um, the guidelines for accountability that we have written into our principles of unity are based on 
things that we've dealt with and um, events that have actually happened um, because, you know, because we're a fairly new organization, um, we've had to learn how to deal with these things as we've gone on. And so um, being sure that we're always improving and we're always thinking about how to prepare ourselves um, for anything else that might come up. And then um, just literally walking our talk, like even, even in like a simple, like they were having a teach-in, we make sure that um, the labor isn't gendered and we make sure that there's this redistribution um, of labor and particularly gendered labor. So things like cooking, like folding chairs, um, like childcare, uh, we make sure this disproportionately doesn't fall on the women and femmes um, within our group, and uh, we make that really clear up front. We also prioritize um, femmes in positions of leadership um, and always make sure that their voices are centered no matter what. And um, it's, it is rough because um, like Jolene was saying, this is not something that's exclusive to the right. Um, it manifests on the left a lot. And um, a lot of the critiques that we might get are somehow always to some extent gendered in a way, which is really bizarre and like totally non-productive to how we talk with each other as leftists, especially if we're trying to be in solidarity with each other. Um, and I think there's another aspect um, of it too, as, as Native people and as a Native liberation organization, um, with how we confront these ideals within our own communities and how we confront um, gendered violence that might be justified through um, what we call toxic traditionalism. Um, so that's uh, a challenge that I can talk a little bit more about later uh, when I talk about what um, Pueblo Feminist Caucus has been through. But yeah, I think like for right now, what comes to mind with how we're dealing with it is just making sure that these are conversations we have up front and making sure that we're very open about our history of how we've dealt with these things, um, where we've fallen short and what we've done to be accountable and do better. Awesome, thank you, Jennifer. Our next question is about the pandemic. Uh, the pandemic is weighing heavily on all of us in so many ways, physically, economically, socially, and emotionally. As someone who's dedicated so much time uh, of, and uh, energy in your life uh, to building a better world for everyone, how are you sustaining yourself in this time? Uh, what is inspiring you to keep going and move forward? Um, I'm going to start with Jen, and then I'll go to Thea, and then I'll go to Jolene. Jennifer? Yeah. Um, yeah, this is a big one, geez. Um, I think right now our, our main thing is fighting demoralization and understanding that revolutionaries have always used times of crisis as an opportunity to push the struggle forward. Um, and um, it might be kind of corny, but like we're even, you know, kind of thinking like, well, you know, someone like Lenin lived through a pandemic, right? And like, if we look at these certain revolutionary moments in time, like there was actually, you know, other uh, revolutionaries who lived through this kind of thing without Zoom or phones. <laughs> um, but also, um, we've kind of had to shift. I mean, as all of us have, we, we've had to shift um, what we're giving priority to and um, what kind of projects um, we think would best serve our community. And that changes everywhere, right? Uh, everyone's material conditions are different throughout different spaces. Um, so um, for example, like we've started gardening um, and it's not an explicitly political activity, but um, you know, considering the circumstances, considering that, you know, in a place like Albuquerque, Native people are constantly forced off their own land and brutalized on their own land. The reclamation of connecting to land like that um, does become something more political. And it's also um, an effort to ensure that people are fed, um, regardless of whatever um, crisis brings up in the future. Um, and also just making sure that we're educating people, um, making sure that um, 
there's a read available for people to kind of make sense of what's happening because there's so much information coming at us every day and it's so overwhelming. Um, it can be hard to um, stay optimistic in general. I and mean, even for somebody who is a well-seasoned organizer, somebody who has um, really well-rounded politics um, in, in a time of such uncertainty, that can be really difficult. Um, hang on, let me look at the question again real quick. Um, okay. Yeah, and so what inspires me personally to keep going is um, the idea that we are um, going to emerge from the stronger. Um, I've noticed that our, our membership has almost doubled since the pandemic started. So people are getting radicalized. People are interested in doing something now. And I think um, that speaks volumes. I think people are, you know, I think the contradictions of the U.S. are more visible than ever. I think the contradictions of settler colonialism are more visible than ever. And I think people are starting to understand how opportunist the U.S. is, whether it's, you know, putting sanctions on Iraq and Venezuela or um, refusing to assist Native nations in COVID relief. I think it's, it's more apparent than ever um, that things need to change. Um, and so that's what's really been giving me hope is that, um, people are going to be radicalized by this. Thank you, Jennifer. Thea? Thank you. Um, great question. Um, and one I kind of think about and ask myself every day. I mean, I think on a personal level, um, uh, and I'll go to the, the broader political question in a moment, but on a personal level, I think what keeps me going is just just friends and comrades that are just willing to do what it takes to maintain our relationships. Like, you know, whether it's phone calls or texts or just like following each other on Instagram and like making a nice comment, like you look cute today, like stuff like that is just, you know, and cooking um, is also something that, that gives me personal sustenance and that I enjoy. And I know that's really hard for a lot of folks now that are struggling with income, but you know, it's something that I have the privilege of being able to, have ingredients and be able to sort of make that in my home and so those those two things on a personal level like keep, like maintaining those networks and relationships um and being able to sort of feed myself and 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 the kind of i think also like the psychological benefits that come from that are important for me um more politically in terms of what inspires me and, and keeps me moving forward, um, I've been extremely inspired by how people have been responding to this crisis. I don't want to like romanticize crisis. And I think that Jennifer's points were very on point, like crisis creates opportunities. It also exacerbates contradictions. And obviously there's a huge amount of human suffering right now, especially in the global South. And I'm saying the global South as a concept that I think about as something that is also in the US. I don't just mean like other countries in the world. I'm thinking about exactly the frontline indigenous and people of color communities that Jennifer was also referring to. That is the global South more broadly. And th there is like just a tremendous amount of suffering that's highly structured by race and class and gender inequality. So, um, but, but in and despite and through that, there is so much creative organizing happening to respond to those contradictions um, and those dynamics that we see unfolding. And just like the way that people, ordinary people have been able to organize despite the difficulties of both immediate need, like their individuals and households are in crisis and don't have income and, you know, and also social distancing makes it hard to protest in normal ways. Like despite those two constraints, like people around um, the US, for example, and of course in other parts of the world are doing really incredible things very creatively. So like the, the, the labor strikes that we've been seeing, there's been this historic strike wave um, the past year or two. Um, a lot of that started with, of course, teacher strikes, nurses strikes, service sector strikes more generally, and to see how warehouse workers and grocery store workers and Amazon workers are sort of taking up that banner of strike and demanding fair treatment and safety at the workplace and actually getting results is extremely inspiring to me. Um, the rent strikes are extremely inspiring to me. I don't know if people looked at that map of like every single rent striker across the country. It's a lot of people went on rent strike May 1st and like 
actually identified as like rent striking, not just like, oh, I couldn't pay my rent, but this is also a political and social act of defiance. And so that was very inspiring um, to me. Uh, uh, something that we're trying trying to encourage out of DSA eco-socialists um, is, and, and that other groups around the country have been doing is utility bill strikes. So I think that's another really inspiring piece. And then one last thing, and I'll, I'll end here, is something that I've done in my own home and, and I'm hoping that other folks around the country also do is just banner dropping. I know not all of us have the, the privilege. I have a nice landlord as landlords go and he's not gonna like be upset about a you know, people over profits banner and he's like a lefty dude, whatever, you know, I know that's not most people's situation with their landlords, but to the extent that like you have the ability to hang a banner outside your home, I think that reclaiming a public space is really important under conditions of social distancing. And I just love all the cancel rent banners across the country, the cancel rent banner drops, not just outside homes, but of course off of like bridges and public buildings and people, def you know, defacing with graffiti billboards and putting up cancel rent stuff in Baltimore and New York City. And just that visual impact of we are still protesting even if we are limited by social distancing is very inspiring to me. Um, and I absolutely agree with what Jennifer said. I think that like, of course the right wing is taking full advantage of this and in, imperialist policies are taking full advantage of this, but also people are being radicalized by this. So that opens up a whole set of questions around how we channel that radicalism um, into organizations and into enduring forms of, of popular power. Jolene? Hi everybody. So um, you're probably tired like I am. Um, we're not going anywhere and we're still tired. Um, I'm currently homeschooling and working a full-time job and then I have my unpaid firm work. Um, before I go into like what's sustaining me, I do want to put out the disclaimer that um, self-care won't solve structural oppression. So I want like this to be taken within that lens. Um, some of you talk, have heard me talk about this before. Um, so, so full disclaimer: like I've actually lost two aunts already in COVID. They're both they were both registered nurses without the proper protective equipment. Um, it's been hitting the Filipino American community particularly hard and disproportionately, um, and so. The first few weeks when they passed, it was really hard to <clears throat> engage fully in my political work and grieve at the same time, right? It kind of gives you a glimpse into what other folks in the past that have survived things like this um, have had to do in order to resist. Um, so you're like constantly grieving and constantly moving and organizing. It's, it's new for me. Um, uh, but with that in mind, um, there are a few practices that I feel like have been I've been using for the last 17 years. Uh, like one of them is is resting and doing so collectively. I know that sounds that sounds strange, but um, in a firm, uh, if I needed a few days to grieve, um, I had a partner in a firm that I could hand off my work to so that I could make sure that the collective work is still done. Um, and then I came back, right? Like it was almost like I need, I need two days. I need two days just to like reset, to check in on my mom um, from afar. Uh, you know, all these strange things that we're doing right now. Um, but making sure that I'm still engaged in the collective was really, it's really important for not feeling alone. Um, so it's like resting with accountability. Um, another thing is reading, I'm trying to read everything I can, um, not just the news, but um, I've been reading a lot of fiction, a lot of sci-fi too, although I don't know if that's like the best genre to read right now, it's kind of scaring me, uh, uh, but um, reading, I think, feeds into what I'll talk about later um, when, when we're talking about um, um, constantly revisiting our vision. Um, turning to a lot of other organizers, mentors, uh, just people around uh, around that are doing political work. It, it's, it's weird, like I can't hug them, but like the fact that we're on like a parallel path uh, means, means something to me. Um, and then I think the most important thing that links back to reading is vision. Um, something that 
I asked in a firm was what kind of world, what kind of world do you want to build um, when, when we're able to push out of this? I think that that's something that every organizer needs to know the answer to. We talk about freedom a lot. What does that look like? If you can't articulate it um, without just uh, naming defensive fights or the absence of, the absence of racism, the absence of sexism, uh, the absence of ableism, ageism, right? Then, then essentially like we're, we're missing a link um, that, that folks have robbed from us. Um, so I'm several generations away from my family living in freedom, maybe more than several centuries away from it. But I think that that's important to tap back into for us organizers in this time. It'll also help, help us creatively think about organizing strategies. Um, so those are my, those are my things. Self-care won't solve structural oppression, but it's important to rest. It's important to read. It's important to talk to other organizers. And I want you to write down that vision of, of freedom. Awesome. Thank you. It sounds like a better world is possible. Is that what I hear you saying? <laughs> um, thank you, everyone. So, um, I'm going to move on to our kind of our other portion of our panel where we're going to meet uh, chat with each one of our panelists a little bit more in depth about their work. Um, I'm going to be starting off with Jolene, and then I'll be moving on to Thea and then ending off with Jennifer. So Jolene, I'm going to put you on the spot first. Um, Jolene, how do you describe feminism in this time? Are there lessons to be learned right now from feminist movements that you've been a part of or have learned from? And what are the new practices or understandings you're experiencing or developing? Okay, that's a lot. All right. So um, similar to what I said about being able to articulate our own freedom, I think that this is an important moment for us to pause and look back to feminist foremothers um, because what they've done have, got, have gotten us here already. I think that's like a really important thing and in the uh, capitalist uh, like US education system history history uh, classes um, I feel like we're we're led to believe that we always have to make up something new we always have to make up something new we don't have the answer um, and so I think first it's important for us to study our feminist foremothers um, and that can come in the form of reading books, or it could also just come in talking to our actual grandmothers. Um, so for example, my Lola, my grandmother, uh, they both lived through World War II in the Philippines. Um, and something growing up that I remember when we started in this pandemic and there was like this flurry and this like rush to go to the grocery stores, is I remember one, um, their like meticulous, um, collection of canned goods. Um, I never understood why they always had it. I like, you know, there's like grocery stores here, Nanang, like we could do this, you know. Um, but that was really important. And they also taught me how to garden. So those are the two things. And they also taught me how to live with scarcity, something that I have to relearn. Um, my grandmother was a comfort woman who was uh, taken by Japanese imperial troops and systematically raped. Um, and she survived that, and then she was also able to teach us how to survive. And I think that that can't be understated. Um, my parents' generation survived martial law in the Philippines, and we all see it right now. We see increased police presence. Uh, we see the deployment of uh, the National Guard in our cities, especially where, where there are people of color. <laughs> like, you see that park in New York City with like all those folks just hanging out and then like in the other borough uh you know police are like taking violently taking down a black man um for being outside there the we can learn from what our parents lived through um uh during martial law when we talk about security within our organizations right and how we communicate with one another um how we send and receive sensitive information um, and just like how to deal with fascists. 
we've seen it generation after generation. And there's, of course, we're going to learn new things, but also if there's no harm in like revisiting those lessons. Um, and I think that for feminism, particularly now, if we don't act as feminists, we're going to be obliterated. Um, I saw news articles where it said like over a thousand women in Mexico were killed in the last three months. Uh, interpersonal violence, domestic violence. At least 16 women in the UK were killed by their by their partners or by an ex-partner. Um, here in the US, like the best statistic I could find was that uh, over 35% increase in calls to hotlines regarding domestic violence. Um, uh, there have been headlines that say domestic violence has doubled in, in multiple countries. We're going to be killed if we don't engage in feminist practice um, and it's women who are closest to poverty who are being killed first and and more so um, so when I talk about being feminist in this time it's um, it's bringing your your class organizing your class analysis and merging it with feminist uh, analysis and organizing right we're on the precipice of built of a new world. The old world is not going to exist. Now, are we going to are we going to consolidate the way we did in 2008, which was a failure? Are we going to allow the capitalists to win again and again and again and build particularly on women's backs? Or are we going to put forth that vision that we were we were just talking about um, and organize around it with women of color, with women at the table in leadership positions? That's the key question, right? Um, and I think that um, just like feminism saved my life as an individual, it has the power to transform this entire society. Patriarchy didn't exist until, until the colonizers came. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you, we can say that about so many of the countries that we come from. Uh, gendered language didn't even exist in the Philippines until the Spaniards came. Um, and women were healers and leaders and, and, um, and um, they gave spiritual guidance to entire societies. So we already have the answer. And I do like ask people to ask us to re-explore that uh, because I do believe that we have the tools to win. Um, we've already seen them in movements around the world. And I, I think that all we have to do is just carry it through. Thank you, Jolene. This next question is also for you. Uh, your work in a firm crosses borders and connects you with organizers around the world. Uh, the US left and DSA are really needing to lift up our relationship um, to socialist and left movements internationally now more than ever. Um, how might we more effectively do this as organizers? Uh, what questions should, be, should we be asking as a U.S.-based and often U.S.-focused organization that can strengthen global uh, solidarity? Okay. Um, so, a firm, we in a firm identify as um, transnational feminists. We're the first uh, to explicitly identify that and as that. And what, what we mean by being transnational feminist and anti-imperialist at the same time is that we believe in organizing deeply where we reside and then organizing horizontally across uh, so-called borders. Um, and respecting the fact that with that comes privilege, uh, regardless of uh, regardless of how poor we may be in the U.S., it, poverty looks different in other countries. It's just, it's just the reality of it. Um, and so that's when the anti-imperialist analysis comes in, right? It, it takes that into account. Um, and we chose to engage this way versus uh, like more traditional solidarity organizing, which was our first 20 years of our organization, actually. Um, because what we learned is that, for example, uh, the last several presidents in the Philippines, like Gloria Macapagal Arroyo and Joseph Estrada, we all engaged in like oust XYZ, right, president. Very similar to like the Latin American left movements here um, when we talk about solidarity. But what we were learning is that in focusing on that, we were also 
we were simultaneously and unfortunately ignoring uh, what we were needing to do in our home territory. Um, so for example, we had like, there were like 37 trafficked workers that we were like working with, but we weren't mounting a full campaign with them because we were worried about ousting a president in another country. So when we relaunched as a firm, we knew we had to focus on deep organizing here. Um, and we've done a few transnational campaigns. One is called Justice Not Charity, where we partnered with Philippine women, and then afterwards, we also had partnered with women in Puerto Rico after uh, the hurricane and the typhoon. Um, and we just like sat down with them and did like a long, long listening session where they live. So that meant going to, for example, um, living and organizing. I only did it for like a month. I just want to let you all know it wasn't like long um, in a destroyed shanty town in Leyte, right? So sit down, talk to the women, ask them like, so what's going on? And, and people I think would assume based on like a Red Cross and other formations that were there that the women would say like, we need money or we need food. And they didn't even say that. <laughs> but just by like focusing on 80% listening, um, they were like, we need one, we need job training. Two, we need traffickers out of here because all these like poverty pimps are picking us up. Um, and three, we don't, want we don't want mental health workers to come here and tell us uh, what we need and how tra traumatized we are. We're asking actually to build a new uh, train the trainers so that we don't have to count on licensed professionals, quote unquote, to help us get through the trauma of like losing our homes, of losing our children. Um, and so then we like repartnered, brought women of color from different communities in the US and put that together. And then we did like a transaction, right? Where we still, we're still in touch. We still coordinate our organizing. Um, but that's like an example of some transnational work that we've, that we've done, um, very similar to Puerto Rico also. And, and I want to say like also Hawaii, like Hawaii, it's, it's, it's actually, it's its own nation. And we have a, we have a chapter there, but, uh, the organizing looks different because it's, it's a different, it's a different nation. Um, uh, so that's, that's what I think we need to do as U.S. based, um, organizers. Um, listen, <laughs> listen, and take it from there. Um, sometimes traditional leftist models of organizing may not be relevant or may not be wanted. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it. Awesome. Thank you, Jolene. Um, I'm gonna um, ask you just one really brief question. Um, and that's to uh, kind of take that theme that you were just talking about, about centering the work of women and women of color. Could you tell us a little bit about how that also played into organizing around the UTLA strike and how women were centered at the strike movement? Sure. So um, I just want to say before you all meet Cecily Meyer Cruz, our incoming UTLA president next week, that um, the UTLA strike of 33,000 educators across 937 school sites in Los Angeles would not have happened without women of color. Um, women are over 70% of union membership here at United Teachers Los Angeles. Um, the largest population of educators are actually Latinx. Um, and I am a regional organizer. I'm full-time union organizing staff, um, but women of color are at every single level of leadership in United Teachers Los Angeles, from our incoming president and the majority of our officers, to our board of directors, to our House of Representatives, to every single one of those 937 elected, peer elected chapter chairs at every single school site. Um, Women of color uh, determined the direction of our organization, our strike. Uh, they, they brought to the table um, 
organizations like Black Lives Matter so that we could have common good demands. So, you know, you all saw us on strike for five days um, and we fought for better staffing because our kids need like a nurse at every school and, and more counselors and more teachers. Um, but also, you know, because of this coalition of other organizations, um, we also won through our strike um, resources for undocumented families. Uh, green space so our kids um, have places to play like there's no park around where I'm living in Northeast LA um, and and then also we ended this so-called random searches of our students by school police they were racist uh, searches of our of our uh, students um, so um, there's no way of <laughs> no, no other way to say it without women of color the strike would not have happened and it would not have won. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Jolene. I gotta also give a shout out, former UTLA member right here. So I gotta just give a little shout out. I love UTLA and uh, learned a lot of really wonderful lessons there that certainly help organizing now in DSA. So thank you. Um, Thea, um, I'm going to move on to you next. Um, how do you describe eco-socialism in this time? Are there lessons to be learned right now from eco-socialist movements that you've been a part of or learned from? And what are the new practices or understandings uh, that you're experiencing and developing? Um, thank you. Um, great question. Um, so. I, the way that I define eco-socialism, and I think that this sort of is consonant with my comrades in the eco-socialist working group, is, is thinking about what, um, thinking about and demanding, and, and I'm just going to go back to Jolene's excellent point earlier around like vision, right? So like, what is the world that we want to create? Um, and so an eco-socialist world for me is one in which we have democratic control over what we as communities need to not only survive at a basic level, but also to thrive and flourish. So a key piece of eco-socialism is that democratic and participatory control over the conditions of our social and natural existence. And but but sort of combined with, and this is the more maybe eco part of it, an awareness of planetary limits and um, and a goal of having like a less extractive relationship with nature. So that's a very broad definition. Um, and I could get into some more specifics, but I want to say at the outset, since part of the question is like, what movements have inspired me or like, why do I have this, this understanding of eco-socialism? Um, and I think, you know, there are movements all over the world that like may or may not call themselves eco-socialists, though they, they, they do in some contexts, um, but that I think are fighting for that sort of overall vision. Um, a lot of my work, both solidarity work and, and research work um, uh, has been in Latin America. And I think like there are extremely inspiring movements there that um, are oftentimes um, specifically around like anti-extractive kind of mobilization. So resisting oil or mining or mega development projects. Um, and a lot of those movements that are rooted usually either in indigenous communities or in mestizo campesino communities are um, but also in urban contexts as well, um, are have a vision of of a sort of more um, harmonious kind of socio natural existence, and that to me is very inspiring. Um, and I think another kind of way to think about eco socialism, and this kind of picks up on some things I was saying earlier, is um, thinking about a variety of social justice movements, so like housing justice and transit justice, whether or not they talk about the climate, whether or not they frame themselves as, as environmentalists, like those to me are key kind of struggles for eco-socialism, like having a world in which everyone has affordable housing, having a world in which um, teachers and nurses um, are dignified and valorized and better paid, that to me are, you know, those are green jobs, care work is essential to um, to my vision of, of eco-socialism. So what Jolene was saying earlier um, about um, both about the UTLA, but also specifically around that demand for green spaces in public schools, I think is like a key example of how eco-socialist um, organizing can come through, labor organizing can come through, fighting for a better school system um, and a variety of other struggles. So I don't see climate or environmental stuff is something that is like separate from these other things that we're involved in. I think any movement that is that is trying to create dignified livelihoods, democratic control, and have an awareness of of both like 
planetary limits, but also like the, the bounty and wonders of, of nature and wanting to connect with that, that to me is sort of a broad way of, of understanding eco-socialism. Um, I think I'll pause there because I feel like there'll be another question and I don't want to talk too much um, on the first one. You're right, there is a second question. So our okay, second question. I'm ready. Uh, what kind of organizing are you doing in your DSA capacity and in the broader movement around the stimulus and the Green New Deal? Uh, how do we fight, how do, again, how do we continue fighting for eco-socialism in this moment? Um, well, I'm very glad you asked that because um, we have a new campaign um, that's come out of um, DSA Eco-Socialist Working Group and the Green New Deal Campaign Committee. I'm going to, oops, I'm going to drop it in the chat. Um, uh, for later or whenever you want to click on it. It's just a Google form in case you want to get involved. Um, so our current campaign is hashtag cancel bills and it's around demanding an end to, to basically canceling rent, canceling utility payments, um, and basically what we call decommodifying survival, like making it so that we don't have to go through the market and through these privatized mechanisms in order to have a place to live, in order to get the electricity and heat um, uh, and, and internet and all of the basic utilities that all of us deserve. So it's a campaign that centers on people's kind of immediate needs right now and sort of to answer your question around how we're orienting to this moment, it centers on people's immediate needs, but it also has this more emancipatory vision of what would it look like to publicly and democratically control these essential services, again, whether it's housing, whether it's utilities, um, whether it's internet, water, electricity, all of these things, and an eco-socialist vision would be democratically controlled and would be ecologically sustainable. So I think that even demand to not you know, pay all our money to private landlords, to not pay these exorbitant rates for our, util for our basic utilities are in essence eco-socialist demand. So it's sort of working with what people need in the moment and bringing a political analysis to that that connects it to another way to organize society that would be less exploitative, less rapacious, less extractive, more egalitarian, feminist, racially just. Um, and, and, and all of those things. Um, so I, I, I actually, in a way, don't think it's difficult. I don't want to downplay the challenges of organizing in this moment, but I actually, you know, and this goes back to something that Jennifer was saying earlier, like, in a way, it's not difficult to make those connections right now. Like, we actually, people are experiencing in their everyday lives how terrible our system is. And if with a little bit of analysis, a little bit of popular pedagogy, and a little bit of organizing, like, that you can connect all of those issues that you experience in your daily lives to these broader systems and then you know learn learn a theory of power and a theory of change that allows you to actually feel like you have agency collectively of course um, um, over those conditions and can do something about them so that's that's what we're doing in dsa eco socialists the cancel bills campaign and i'll just note one other thing that i'm i'm trying to talk about with multiple comrades in different spaces is thinking about how to make very clear and bold demands on congress right now and to be perfectly honest like i'm not a person that generally orients to congress like i am someone that you know my partner can testify to this it took me a long time to even like be interested in electoral politics at all as like a leftist i'm like you know now think electoral politics are a very important tactic um, in terms of getting socialists into office. Um, but I definitely wasn't someone that was like paying attention to the nitty gritty of what Congress is debating. But I think right now in this moment where Congress is bailing out big corporations, like we need to make very bold demands and we cannot, and, and I think, I don't remember if it was Jolene or Jennifer that made this excellent point earlier, like we cannot repeat what happened in 2008. Like that was a moment where the left was in like an honestly weaker position overall politically and there was just a huge corporate bailout and basically every single aspect of our society got worse like the racial gap wealth gap increased right like precarity increased financialization of our economy increased and like the power of corporations increased and and we're already seeing that with the existing federal stimulus measures but we really need to make bold demands around cancel rent, um, around like when we are rebuilding infrastructure to not rebuild fucking fossil fuel, pardon my French, you know, fossil fuel pipelines and highways, but to actually build a better world. Um, and that we all deserve that like, you know, the tax dollars that go into our public investment should be paying for things that lift up communities, not things that bail out corporations. So I think that we need to be very bold, be unfortunately, because it can be a little boring, paying attention to Congress, making socialist demands and not being, you know, and not being intimidated to do that because, you know, by the crisis and, and by the fact that the right wing is, of course, going to, 
you know, um, be pejorative about anything that we demand, but we shouldn't worry about that. We should just make the bold demands. Cause I think as, as Jennifer said earlier, people are radicalized and people are listening and people are searching for ways to feel collective agency over the situation. And I think that's kind of what socialist analysis can, can offer. Awesome. Thank you, Thea. Um, next up is Jennifer. So Jennifer, I'm going to be asking you a couple questions. Uh, the first one um, is about uh, the Red Deal. I wanted to give some context a little bit for DSA members um, who are on the call. Um, last year at convention, uh, when uh, the DSA convention delegates were all voting to uh, about uh, to um, approve the Green New Deal resolution. There was uh, an amendment brought up to also endorse the Red Deal, which was developed by the Red Nation at that time. Both of those uh, resolutions passed unanimously at convention. Um, at that time, uh, I believe uh, only Red Deal Part One was available uh, at that time. Uh, that was back in August, and we've had a. I know that the Red Nation has had a lot of movement, and Part Three just dropped last week. Uh, so, Jennifer, I was hoping that you could give us um, more updates and uh, about the work of the Red Deal and how that also intersects with eco socialism and socialist feminism. Sure. So I'll just do a little overview of the Red Deal. So um, the Red Deal is derived of our 10 point program, which was the very first document we wrote um, as Red Nation. It's reminiscent of um, the Black Panther um, 10 point program. And so from that, we um, kind of elaborated on it and um, took into consideration our present moment and um, got the Red Deal. So the Red Deal is a product of um, being in coalition. It's had the input of Red Nation comrades and also people who aren't in the Red Nation, but who we consider comrades and relatives. It has the input of youth, of elders, of academics, of non-academics, um, really everybody from all walks of life um, who we believe has a place in the struggle. Um, and so uh, I'd like to clarify, um, it's not the new Red Deal because it's the same old deal, right? Um, really what we're trying to look at is the ways that indigenous people have always um, practiced communalism and how that can be taken up again in a way that isn't um, necessarily going back or romanticizing um, you know, primitivism, but taking our core values and applying them in a way um, that is useful to organize people right now. Um, so it was proposed in spring of 2019 um, by Red Nation comrades in response to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's um, Green New Deal resolution. Um, and the Red Deal is inspired by uh, Black abolitionist movements and the Movement for Black Lives platform, which um, calls for a divestment movement divesting from prisons, police, fossil fuel, surveillance, exploitative corporations. And the Red Deal is not a document for the approval of higher powers, i.e. elected officials, corporations, CEO, etc. But it's for the bottom, the rowdy, the rugged, still learning, beginning, and experienced activists, defenders, um, protectors, and all relatives of the world. So um, the Red Deal is premised on four principles. Um, there are three areas of struggle we cover and 20 specific issues that are covered in it. So the four principles are what creates crisis cannot solve it, change from below and to the left, politicians can't do what only mass movements can do, and from theory to action, and I'll get more into detail about those in a bit. And the three areas of struggle, which are the three parts um, that have been broken into and that have been released gradually are in the occupation. So that was the first one um, that DSA had voted to adopt. The second one was Heal Our Bodies. And the third one that just dropped is Heal Our Planet. So um, I won't name all of the 20 specific issues because um, it's kind of a lot, but some of them include um, defunding police, La Migra and CPS, um, ending border town violence, free and sustainable housing for everyone, uh, free education, free health care, um, non-carceral mental health services for all, um, 
ending MMIWG2, domestic violence, um, reproductive justice, um, traditional sustainable agriculture, the enforcement of treaty rights, etc. So um, I want to emphasize principle four from theory to action and what that means in the context of what we're talking about here. Um, so a huge part of the Red Deal is not a document about what's happening in the world, but it, it, we hope that it provides community-based solutions and action points um, so people can learn how to organize around them and address them in their local community. Um, there's a lot of research and thought from all these specific issues that stem from the grassroots, grassroots community work, and um, we take directly from community approaches um, that work to address them. So. Um, again, this is collective knowledge that went into this. And um, why is a red deal needed? Well, we know that um, the Green New Deal is a congressional resolution. It lays out a grand plan for tackling climate change, but the resolution is not binding. So even if Congress approves it, there's nothing in a proposal that would become law. And so that's... Um, one of the reasons the Red Deal differs is because um, we like to see it more as a toolkit for um, communities to use on the ground, wherever they may be, and for them to use it however it applies to whatever issues they're facing there. Um, and so you can access the Red Deal um, on our website, therednation.org. Um, there's been multiple interviews, webinars, and podcasts. Um, the Red Nation podcast, Generation Justice. Um, we've also had some highlights for the Red Deal written in Teen Vogue, The Guardian, um, Institute for Policy Studies, etc. We've had some right wingers and Zionists write about it. They make it sound way more powerful than I think it is. They're always they always know how to flatter us without trying, right? <laughs> um, um and yeah it's been endorsed by one of the largest marxist oriented organizations in the united states the dsa so um we're happy that it's all finally out um i think one piece that i would encourage folks on this um call to look at is um traditional and sustainable agriculture which is in the healing our planet area um for an example of what of how um, Pueblo feminist praxis was incorporated into this. So that portion was actually written by um, the Public's Feminist Caucus as a whole. And we had input from, um, from elders, from leaders, and it's pretty extensive. Um, and in that, we're trying to also offer concrete examples of what you can do wherever you are, um, how you can educate yourself, how you can engage in um, actions or even just um, um, agricultural knowledge. So that's the Red Deal. And um, I think the Red Deal is more relevant than ever um, in this you know, post-COVID world. Um, as I was helping to draft this final portion, we kind of decided that we needed to reframe this last portion of the Red Deal in response to what's happening now with COVID. And in many ways, the, the portions prior to COVID were almost like foretelling of what would happen because, you know, the whole point of writing it is to prepare for um, a world without capitalism and the challenges we face in getting there. Um, I think another thing that this last portion really focuses on too is um, talking about um, which labor counts as valid labor, which which uh, which types of labor have uh, value, and of course the labor that's making the world run, run round right now, which is primarily domestic labor and gendered labor. Um, you know, it's it's unpaid and it's um, it's undervalued. So whether that's caretaking, um, caring for elders, children, even a garden, even our non-human relatives, um, this isn't seen. Is valid labor, and so we're looking to change the narrative, and um, that's one of the points um, at which we start to develop um, how we see socialism in an indigenous within an indigenous feminist framework. Um, I think I missed anything. 
for that one. No, I think that's great, Jennifer. I think that also really seg segues really nicely into uh, the second portion of the question, which is um, you mentioned earlier that you had founded the Pueblo Puebla uh, Pueblex Feminist Caucus of uh, the Red Nation. And I wanted to see if you could tell us a little bit about what you've learned from working uh, within that caucus of the Red Nation and how that also informs uh, your activism and struggles. Sure. Yeah, so I'm a co-founder. Um, there was there was a few comrades who founded it, and um, we noticed that um, as Pueblo people um, organizing in urban spaces with um, often a lot of non-Pueblo people, it kind of was difficult to bring some of the unique issues we were facing to the forefront um, because they're kind of very taboo to talk about within our communities, and then I think a lot of people outside of our communities aren't even really aware about, uh, aren't really aware of what's happening. But I actually think they're just, um, you know, reminiscent of the much broader overarching issues that um, women of color, femmes of color face um, in general. So um, we started the Public Feminist Caucus in response to the unique types of heteropatriarchy that plague our community. Um, in many of our communities, um, women cannot hold positions of leadership, they can't vote, they um, are, are relegated to um, the realm of the domestic most of the time. And we know that that is contrary to our traditional beliefs and to um, our stories. And so a comrade of mine, Justine Pila, coined the term toxic traditionalism which um, can be applied, you know, of course, outside of the public context um, to describe the way violence is justified under the guise of traditionalism, um, specifically gendered violence and um, uh, violence pertaining to identity formation and citizenship. So um, we, we officially formed in 2018 um, we kind of announced our presence at a first of its kind indigenous feminist panel in Gallup, New Mexico, which is a notoriously violent border town. Um, and then after that, we kind of started um, getting into motion, having events um, in Santa Fe, and um, we were going to actually on May 9th, but we can't do that anymore. And I think some of the most um, important um, Things we've done, some of the highlights and the successes are um, creating this movement out of the conditions of um, out of the conditions that New Mexico created in terms of like revising history and really um, making Native people out to be their source of profit but also source of exploitation. So um, I don't know how many people here are familiar with the Entrada protest, but um, Red Nation was engaged in um, a protest of a violent reenactment of the so-called bloodless recon reconquest of Santa Fe. It was anything but bloodless, but they have, you know, much like a civil war reenactment, people dressed like conquistadors and, um, you know, just reenacting the um, and taking of Pueblo land. And so um, at the most recent protest of that, we were met with extreme violence. Um, eight people were arrested. There was snipers um, that had their guns aimed at us at all times. There was children, elders there who were put at risk. And um, so kind of out of that momentum around challenging revisionist history in New Mexico came the Public Feminist Caucus. And so after that, we continue to um, confront a lot of that violent history, which is just drenched in patriarchal violence, right? Like, that's, you know, very, like, premise of Spanish conquest to, like, you know, the very thing that created the conditions that we still face in our communities. And so after that, we had a panel in Santa Fe um, um, about um, kind of retracing three centuries of public resistance and what that entailed and just reminding us um, of the traditions of resistance we hold and then a week after that, um, and this was last year, we had 
um, a march for public liberation during Santa Fe Indian Market. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Santa Fe Indian Market, it's one of the biggest Native art shows in the world, and it generates a huge portion of Santa Fe's um, total yearly revenue. Um, so it is notoriously exploitative, um, and so we figured it would be a perfect place to do this march. And I'd consider it one of our most successful actions to date um, because in that march, um, we went to various places around the Santa Fe Plaza where it takes place and we gave the history of certain um, places that are marked with violence, whether it's the cathedral that was built on top of a sacred shrine or uh, the ruins that were destroyed to build a convention center or um, other various racist uh, monuments and murals celebrating both Spanish and U.S. Um, colonization. And, um, you know, we had a public audience. And I thought that was really a very unique action because um, it's not every day that in a march you can get that much information. And I think that's what people were looking for because prior to that we've been, you know, disregarded as just violence and um, not really having a point like rebels without a cause but I think that really grounded um, our work and um, we had a we had a big we had a big crowd that day and we had children participating we had elders speaking um, I remember at one point like a man in tears like came and hugged me and thanked me for the things we were talking about and the things that we were trying to remember so I think that's also a moment of collective remembering, um, which is also really important um, in times like these, just remembering that we do have these traditions of resistance and that we do have um, power that we're entitled to reclaim. Um, so yeah, it's something that I never thought I'd see in my lifetime this soon. And I was just, I felt really blessed and honored to be a part of it. So. Yeah, I think that'd be the highlight so far. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jennifer, Jolene, and Thea for all of your wonderful contributions to this panel today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and kick it over to Hannah, uh, who's going to be wrapping us up as we say our goodbyes here. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, again, thank you so much to our panelists. Hannah? Thanks, Kathy. Um, Thank you again, Jolene and Thea and Jennifer and also Camiela who played music and um, was just a wonderful welcoming force for our call tonight. Um, so the group that put this call together, we are called DSA Socialist Majority um, and we are a caucus in Democratic Socialists of America. DSA, as Kathy said at the top of the call, is the largest socialist organization in the country and we have 200 chapters. Um, and then Socialist Majority is a caucus of DSA, right? Um, where we, we fight alongside each other and, and work to develop each other ideologically and also work to transform the organization. Um, and our caucus um, is focused on building mass multiracial working class power and fighting alongside other working class and progressive groups um, to grow, we believe, the, what, the social force, right? To amass the social force that we think is necessary to win socialism and to transform our world in the ways that we've talked about tonight. Um, so if you are interested, we have been doing lots of socialist majority events on Monday nights. So if you're interested in continuing to stay involved um, in socialist majority or to get involved in socialist majority, um, the link to join socialist majority is there in or to our website and then to um, join is there on our website. Um, and you can join DSA if you're not yet a DSA member at dsausa.org backslash join. Um, yeah, and our next Monday night event um, will also be at 7 my time, I'm in Kansas, but 5 PST, 6 Mountain Time, and 8 o'clock uh, Eastern Time. Um, and that event will be a panel specifically on, on uh, multiracial labor organizing in during COVID and, and thinking about how we build left labor movements. And um, we will have Bianca Cunningham from New York DSA and from Labor Notes. We'll have Bill Fletcher. Um, we'll have Cecily Meyer-Cruz, as Jolene mentioned, from UTLA. 
um, and Peter only from the ILWU. So really excited for that one next week. So join us again, please, next Monday for that. Um, and I just want to, again, say thank you to Jolene and Thea and Jennifer um, and Kathy, our facilitator. Um, glad to be in the struggle with all of you. So wonderful to share space with, with all of you tonight. And thank you everyone for being here. And if you wanna, wanna keep getting involved, just go to socialistmajority.com. Okay, thanks everybody. Thanks, thanks everybody. Solidarity, stay safe. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.